So now we're switching gears a little bit from mainly talking about plugins to talk a little bit more about how Napari can interface with the hardware environment. And this relates a little bit more to the hardware work of the sort of open source instruments that we're developing uh, the Lever Hub project. And I'm very excited to also get to know Lucien Hindeling now um, because we've been interacting a little bit on Twitter, but we've never had a chance to um, <laughs> at least virtually meet each other. So I'm very excited to hear about some of the very cool work that you're doing. Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing that with us. So yeah, thank you yeah. so much for the invitation. Yeah, if you could start with a short introduction of yourself for the rest of the audience, that would be really great. And then we're all excited to hear from you. Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah, um, my name is Lysia. Um, I'm a PhD student in Olivier Pert's lab. I have a background in computer science, but uh, every day I'm drifting further into the field of biology, which I actually really enjoy. So um, it's really a pleasure to be combining these two disciplines and to be working on these uh, yeah, new cutting edge software technologies for microscopy. Um, what we do in the lab, we're a signaling dynamics lab, um, and we are interested in how cytoskeleton um, dynamics affect, for example, migration, and how signaling components regulate the cytoskeleton dynamics. But we're also interested in collective dynamics. So here, for example, you see a collective of stem cells. Um, and we're interested in how these cells communicate with each other and how population um, scale dynamics arise from the interaction of individual cells when they communicate with each other. Um, a lot of our work would absolutely not be possible without um, complex image analysis, either because the biosensors require some pre-processing, as we've heard in the last talk, sometimes you need to have this processing step before you can actually read out the quantification. We also have this, for example, in thread based probes or in translocation based probes, or because we just have too much data and we cannot like analyze it without dimensionality reduction and averaging. And what you see here played in the movie is some analysis of, of the stem cell colony. And what you can see is that we have very multimodal analysis. So we have the tracks, we have the segmentation, we have biosensor quantification. And for this, of course, Napari is amazing because we have all these different layers that we can combine. And it's not just images, but also other kind of data. And it's very interactive and it's um, amazing to also quality control your processing steps. Uh, yeah, I forgot to say, please just interrupt if you have any questions. So the usual way we, that we do experiments in the lab is that we have um, an imaging experiment and then we do the analysis, then we think about it and then we go to the next experiment, right? Um, but there's also, there's always this in-between step of image analysis before we can start a new experiment. So what my research interest is, is how we can combine the, the experiments with the analysis in one step so we, that we can lose this, this in-between step and increase the iteration time. So it would look like this. We have the experiment, and then we do the image analysis in real time while we do the experiment. And that way, we can directly react um, and adjust imaging parameters. For example, I, I did a lot of bad experiments because I, I did them. It's an overnight experiment. It takes eight hours. And then the next morning, I realized the cells don't segment or I've taken the wrong exposure times. It doesn't work with my classifier. And this time, when you can preview your analysis on the live data, um, you don't have these issues. So you can take better images that are suited for your post-processing steps. But the even bigger advantage, I would say, is that you have um, this whole data already available at the experimental step, and you can use it to guide your experiment. And I will come to that in a few minutes. So what we need to do first is to load, uh, to live stream basically the data um, from the microscope into Napari. I mean, we use Napari because we already use it in the in the processing step for our, our normal pipelines. So it's it's like a natural choice to also use it um, as an interface. So here you can see a movie of data that is live streamed from the microscope. And because it's Napari, it's very easy to add interactivity and widgets. So you had just added two widgets that allows you to, to switch the channels, change the exposure times, stuff like that. And it's super easy. It's like 10 lines of Python code to access these microscope functions. 
Um, the software stack is that we use NumPy and PyCromanager um, in Python because we want to use the Python ecosystem for image analysis because all the deep learning tools and our favorite plugins are in there. And then we use Micromanager, which is Java-based, um, as an interface to connect to the hardware. And Micromanager is an amazing piece of software that has um, hundreds of supported devices. I think it's over 250 cameras, uh, lights, stages, etc. Um, and it's it's really well built. And either by using Micromanager or by using PyMM Core, which is a direct Python layer on top of Micromanager, you can interact with it from the Python ecosystem. I won't go too much into detail because the next talk, I guess, will will talk much more about that. But yeah, the, the nice thing here is that you can access basically your hardware directly from Python. And once I, I once I got this first streamed images, I posted it on Twitter and I got a comment um, from Robert and he asked me if I could try his plugin on top of the live streamed data and that it should be able to segment the cells in real time. And of course it worked. It was really a single click to add this plugin and select the classifier and it directly worked on the live stream data. And I think to me, this is um, a bit of the magic of Napari. Once you have data in there, you have the whole Python ecosystem, the whole Napari uh, plugin ecosystem that you can use on top of your data. And it doesn't really matter where it's coming from. If you load it from the disk or if you live stream it from a microscope, you don't need a lot of, um, of adaption to make the code work with live stream data. So why did we build this pipeline in the first place? And for that, I want to give you a bit of biological background. So as I said, we're interested in these population dynamics. So in this movie, you can see an epithelium, a tissue of cells, and you can see a cell dying in the middle and it sends out this signaling wave to its neighboring cells. And this uh, the sensor that we use here is the ERK sensor and the cells that receive this wave are protected from cell death on their own for, for some time. So this is a mechanism that regulates survival in the, in the epithelium. And um, what our speciality is in the lab is building these optogenetic circuits. So this is fantastic work from a previous PhD student, uh, Gorali. Um, she built a system where we have the map K pathway. It's an extremely simplified diagram. <laughs> where we have uh, the receptor that activates downstream ERK, which then decides to cell fight. And the um, actuator biosensor circuit that we have allows us to, um, to with light activate the pathway and then read out downstream how much of the pathway we activated with a biosensor. So we can basically read and write to a, to a pathway. So again, as I said, you can shine blue light on top of a cell it activates ERK in the whole cell, and after some time, it deactivates on its own. But these uh, dynamics, they're happening at the scale of the single cell. So if we want to study how these dynamics actually work, we also want to control um, ERK activation at the single cell level and not just illuminate the whole field of view. And for this, we can use a tiny projector. It's basically the same projector that is built into your movie streaming devices. But instead of projecting it through a lens onto a big screen, we project it down through the microscope objective onto, onto the sample, and we can create tiny images with that. Now, there's a bit of an issue, and that is that the cell moves. I'm exaggerating here a bit by using a movie of a high motility phenotype. But um, yeah, the cells move, and if we just shine light onto a single spot, after some time, the cell will, moved, uh, will have moved away, and we will shine light onto a different cell and not the cell that we actually wanted to shine light on. So I guess you can see where this is going. We use the tracking um, that we have from our image analysis on the microscope to adjust the light pattern to make it stay on top of the cell the whole time. So this is what the, um, what the feedback microscopy pipeline looks like that we have. Um, on the left side, you see the live cells with two biosensors. We have the earth biosensor to read out the pathway activity, and we have a nuclear marker that we can use for tracking. We usually add some kind of marker to our cell experiments just to make it easier to segment and track, but this does not have to be a nucleus. This could also be the edge, for example, or just the skeleton. Then on the right side, we have the software stack where we have Micromanager and Napari to interface with the hardware, and we have our whole image processing pipeline where we do the segmentation, the tracking, 
the bias quantification, etc. And then we can use this data that we extract here um, to decide which cells we want to stimulate in real time. So in this experiment, I've just chosen a bunch of cells in a circular region in the middle of the epithelium, and I continue to track them and activate only those subpopulation of cells. But this could be anything. We could also say activate only the cells um, that are going to die in the next half hour based on their past activity or activate the lowest quantile of cells, activate, I don't know, the cell that is moving the fastest, etc. And what we then get out is this binary stimulation mask where white is the area where we shine light and dark is the area where we don't shine light. And here we can see the actual projected image that we shine onto the sample. And uh, when we look at it afterwards, so here's uh, the final image um, where we see the biosensor quantification. So the green cells are activated and the pink cells are inactivated. And you see that the cells that I marked for stimulation with a circular spot, they're much more active than the cells around them. So we can actually control a subpopulation of cells and study how the rest of the, of the cells react. And if you look at the time up here, it's really crazy how long we can track these cells. We can really and study them over, over multiple hours. Um, just as a side note, uh, to study these collective dynamics, our lab has developed a plugin um, that is called Arcos uh, for Napari. And it's a, it's a software that allows you to extract and track uh, collective events in, um, in collectives of cells, for example. And it's uh, it's amazing because you have this graphical user interface and it's just a couple of clicks and you get um, not only the segmentation and tracking, but you get also these uh, statistics and plots for free. And it doesn't only work on cell collectives or um, different types of cells. So before we've seen um, MGCK cells and now here we see calcium signaling waves, but it also works at the scale of animal populations. Um, so here we see bees that are collectively doing a, a Lola wave um, to defend or to confuse wasps that are attacking the swarm. Um, yeah, if you think you could use this, it's available on the Napari Hub under the name Arcos GUI. And if you're interested in the maths and the logic behind it, there's a paper freshly published in JCB. And now what we didn't envision first when we built the pipeline is that the, um, the accuracy of stimulation is so good that we can actually stimulate subcellular um, parts of cells, not just single cells, but a sub-single cell. So we have exactly the same actuator biosensor circuit that we had before, but this time I select a region that is a couple of pixels above the nucleus and I always stimulate the same region. And what you can see is when I do this, the cell starts moving in a specific direction. So here I stimulate upwards of the nucleus, so the cell starts moving up. Um, this not only works with this map K biosensor circuit, but we also have GTPAs activated biosensor circuits. And for example, here we can activate RAC, which forms protrusions in a cell. And you can see that I'm able to grow the cytoskeleton of this cell in a specific direction. So we have a GDPA that is activated by a GEF, which we genetically modify so it can be active with light. And then um, the GDPA affects the cytoskeleton, and this is what we read out. Um, one of our research questions is if there is cytoskeletal feedback onto the GEFs. So the cytoskeleton um, activates or recruits the GEFs or deactivates the GEFs, which then um, for example, activate uh, the GTPA's row A, which then affects the cytoskeleton in turn. So one of the experiments we were super excited to do is to stimulate only certain parts of the cytoskeleton and then see if there's a difference in activation where we shine light exactly there. So for example, there's um, GEFs that are hypothesized to only live on focal adhesions. So the tiny adhesions that cell use to attach, for example, to glass lights. And you can see that we are able to segment these focal adhesions and shine light to this bit here in yellow, exactly on top of those. And then we use the biosensor to read out um, how much we can activate row A on top of the focal adhesions and how much we change the cytoskeleton. 
And using this automated pipeline, we can even cut the cell in half virtually and use one half of the cell to stimulate on top of focal adhesions and one half to stimulate in between of focal adhesions or next to focal adhesions. And then we get the in control inside of the same cell. And because the whole thing is automated, we were able to scan hundreds of cells and thousands of simulation areas uh, for this paper that we um, just published on the bioarchive. Um, and yeah, you can imagine that it would not be too much fun to sit in front of the microscope and click on, on these tiny focal adhesions for, for basically days in a row and uh, click on them every 10 seconds. So it's really nice to have this automated, otherwise this would have been a pain to do. Um, yeah, and one of the of the really nice things that I would like to stress that goes into what uh, you were saying before the talk is um, that we're interested in in approaches that that are not expensive and that can be easily democratized. So the whole thing that I've shown today, it's it's all software. We didn't buy a single new device um, for this pipeline. Right, what, everything we did was was at software that is able to take these images in real time and we combine it with basically computer vision and machine learning. And for this, uh, I would like to make an analogy um, for the revolution that is happening with self-driving cars, where also basically the self-driving cars are exactly the same car as a normal car. You have the same motor, you have the same chassis, um, you have the same wheels. The only thing that's different is that it has cameras and it has access to machine learning networks and computer vision. And this is enough to achieve extremely high levels of automatization. Uh, one of the drawbacks at the moment is that these um, smart microscopy platforms are extremely customized to specific hardware setups. So I think it took me maybe the better part of a year to set up the first microscope. And when I wanted to set up exactly the same software setup on our second microscopy platform, it still took me like over a month. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's just so many tiny differences between how cameras crash and you have to recover or how fast uh, um, the dichroic mirror wheels turn and different drivers for different cameras that don't work in exactly the same way. And of course, the, the issue is that there's a lack of standardization. And um, one group that tries to fix this is the Smart Microscopy Working Group. And they're working with uh, participants from both academia and industry to create these minimal working examples of smart microscopy workflows. For example, take an image and then move the stage based on some image analysis result um, so that people can agree upon a, a standard and these workflows become much more shareable and more reproducible. Um, if you think this could be interesting for you, the group is still looking for new members, uh, no matter the level of experience, no matter if academia or industry. And yeah, if you're interested, there's information on this web page, there's not too much information yet, but it will be updated after the summer break. So be sure to check back. And if you want to join, you can send an email to smartmicroscopy at eurobioimaging.eu and you will get uh, sent a link to this um, Google doc where you can fill in your email address and your interests and you will get added to the group. Are there any questions so far? Should I continue? It's very impressive. I think there are a number of comments in the chat that you know, of people who are very impressed with what you achieved. Um, and yeah, it's it's clearly <laughs> the future. But I can also empathize with how difficult it is to set up um, from our hardware experience. But there's no particular question at this point, um, at least not communicated. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I don't see the, the comments. So please just interrupt me if there is something that I should react to. Okay. Um, so one of the, the other difficulties uh, with these setups is that we don't have the data beforehand, right? If you want to do image analysis on live data and we have, for example, a new cell line, we don't know how it will look like. So we don't know how we should tune our parameters or we don't have a way to, to have pre-training data to train uh, neural networks. So what's really important for us is that we have tools that are quick to train and have a very interactive way to check if the parameters are tuned correctly um, or if we need to change something. So one thing that we are working on is this pixel classifier that is built in Napari, 
where you can just uh, label a couple of points in an image with the brush. Uh, you click train classifier and 10 seconds later, you have a classifier that is trained on, on you for raw data that's never been seen before. And you can go back and add some corrections and train again. And usually this is good enough to, to segment, for example, new cell lines with new biosensors. Um, the, the trick we're using here is that we take the input image and we scale it a couple of in a couple of different resolutions. And then we take a deep learning network, in this case, a convolutional neural network called VGG16 that is pre-trained on ImageNet. So a huge data set of images that is used to train for object classification. And then we just cut off the first few layers of the network and we feed in this stack of images and we pass it through the filters of the deep neural network that is trained on object classification. So the idea is that because it's trained on classification, the filters are um, optimized to extract features from the image that are relevant to image classification. And once we have these filter responses, we scale them up again, and then we just train a random forest classifier um, on top of these image features. So we don't retrain the whole neural network, we just use it as a feature extractor. And this works surprisingly well. Um, if you think this could be useful for you, there's a proof of concept implementation in TensorFlow on my GitHub. And we also got money from CZA to make a proper Napari plugin for it. And this is work in progress, but it already works. It's um, it's in PyTorch, but it will get even better. And it's on the GitHub profile of Guillaume Witz, and it's called Napari Confplate. So I really recommend you check that out if you think this could work for you as well. So um, let's take a bit of a different direction and I want to talk about the large language models for bioimage analysis. I guess this has been discussed in this workshop as well. I mean, most of us have used ChatGPT to um, to ask it for to help with with image analysis questions. And usually, the way we do it is we ask um, for some kind of image processing that we want to do, and then we get some code back. Uh, we feed it to the image analysis software and to Python. We get some error message. We feed it back to the large language model and we iterate over that. So of course, here is this extra step in between that is us that is annoying and it would be super nice if we could just let the large language model iterate itself on the code. So if it gets an error message, it corrects it itself and only in the end, we get the final error or success message from the whole pipeline and we don't have to care about these small, um, these small errors that it would be able to fix itself and we just used to copy and paste back and forth. So one of the softwares that does this really well is uh, um, Langchain, and there's an implementation for Napari that you probably have heard of um, from Loic Waye, um, where you can type um, your image analysis task and you send it to a large language model. It tries to create some code and um, you will see here in this first case, it gets an error message, but instead of us having to copy the code, it corrects it itself. And this is, um, and after the second try, yeah, it works perfectly well. And the way this is um, implemented is in the Langchain framework, um, and you give the framework basically a task. The large language model decides to take an action, which could be, for example, use a tool or ask the internet or something. And then based on that action, it gets an observation, which is, for example, I got an error message or the segmentation worked. Then it does a fault. So for example, if there's an error message, it tries again, but this time with the context of the error message, and when it was a success, it thinks, okay, this could be my final answer. I sent this to the user. So what I'm interested in is uh, what happens if we give large language models access to the hardware directly. So now if I want to do some image analysis task, I go to the microscope, I take an image of the nuclei, then I give it to the large language model and ask how many nuclei are there? But I could just ask the large language model directly how many nuclei are in my sample, and it knows to take an image of the nuclear channel. It knows how to do the image processing and how to count the nuclei and gives him back the complete answer in one step. This would be kind of the dream, I guess. Um, so the way you can imagine this is I, I just uh, did a, a small 
um, small example here with ChatGPT. So I just fed it the microscope configuration file. I just copy pasted it as plain text and pasted it into ChatGPT and then asked it uh, which configuration uses the UV channel. And by using the general knowledge it has from pre-training about microscopy and biology, it knows that I probably meant the Dapi channel and it gives me um, the correct channel configuration that was stored in the microscope configuration file. Um, but you can also do different things. So for example, you can ask it to take a 20 frame time lapse with one second interval in the UV channel. Usually we do this in the graphical user interface, right? You would select the time points, the positions, the channels, click acquire, and it does it. But what I did here is I just fed it um, to the API that you can use to programmatically um, call MicroManager. And by having access to this API documentation um, that is in the PyMem Core Plus library, um, it was able to figure out the code that it needs to send to the microscope. And this actually works. So here's a demonstration of it. Um, where I ask it to acquire exactly this time lapse. Um, I send it to the large language model. It thinks that it should probably use the tool to create an acquisition. It writes the code, it sends it to the microscope, and you can see the image popping up here. So it's not a real image, it's using a, a virtual camera, but it's using exactly the same architecture from Micromanager. It's running inside of Micromanager, it's just a virtual camera, and it will work exactly the same way with any other camera. And the nice thing is that you can then just follow up with questions. So here I crop it with natural language and tell it to change the color map and it just does it. And I didn't have to write a single line of code to acquire and process the image. Um, what was super weird when trying to implement this is that it's mostly just prompting in a code. So I just show you uh, one slide where I, I try to show you a bit how, how this is done. So what you do when you want to um, at hardware access to a large language model um, is to first create a tool, which is a class in, in LangChain. And you basically let it know about its new superpower, which is hardware access. And you tell it um, with plain text, okay, if you want to take an image um, with the microscope, use this tool. And then inside the tool, you give it even more text where you tell it to write a acquisition function, and then you just copy paste and documentation of the acquisition function below and some generic code instructions like import the necessary libraries, etc. And just by that, and then it's like five more lines of code and um, you have implemented a new tool that can be accessed by, um, by large language models. Um, if you're interested in this, I recommend you to, to watch the code review um, by Loic Wire, where he goes a bit into detail um, about the uh, about the structure of Napari chat GPT. Um, so here's a bit of an overview where you again see what the user can do. And we cannot just write text to the large language model, right? We can also uh, write Python code to interact with Napari or run image processing pipelines, or we can use the graphical user interface directly. And then we can use text to call to the large language model, which send us API calls to uh, the microscope control software, which calls the hardware, and then the data gets passed back from the microscope to the control software in Tunapari. And if you're too lazy to type, you can actually use Whisper, which is one of those AIs that translates voice to text, and it's super fast and runs on your computer. Also, just a couple of lines of um, of Python, and you can record your voice and pass it through Whisper that runs on on a laptop hardware. It takes like yeah, nine seconds to process uh, one sentence and you don't even have to type. You can just talk to your microscope. Um, so to the, the last iteration steps that we try to, to kind of reduce in our lab is that we still, with automated imaging, between each automated imaging experiment, we have to do this interpretation step. So we do and we have an idea for an experiment, we do the automated experiment, then we look at the data, then we start the next um, automated experiment with different parameters. So of course it would be amazing if we have some kind of automated system um, that's running on the microscope that decides on its own which one is the next optimal experiment to do to, to answer our hypothesis. 
now um, to make a to make a bit of an abstraction, maybe you've seen these um, these viral AI apps where you can take an image of your fridge and you tell it, yeah, I would like to eat a salad tonight. Give me a, a recipe, and then based on the ingredients that it finds in your fridge, and of course the thousands of cookbooks it has read in its pre-training, it's able to give you a, a custom recommendation what you could cook um, that you might not have thought of, which even though it's of course um, extremely inspired by stuff it has read, it's maybe something that you wouldn't have thought of. So I guess at some point it, it will be a couple of years out, but um, we can pass the large language model um, the whole scientific literature that is related to our field, we can give it uh, access to our plasmid database, the past uh, papers that we've done, so it knows about the imaging platforms that we have and some research question, and it would help us come up with research questions and by having access to the hardware, um, it could automatically do those experiments. Of course, this is super science fiction, but there's much simpler mathematical frameworks that can already help us today um, with deciding what the next optimal experiment should be. So here you have a, a small example where we try to see, okay, what is the, the response of a cell um, to optogenetic input with different intensity? So the more light we shine, the more it gets active, but you see that it's not a, a linear relationship as often we have it the case in biology. So we have a experimenter input, experiment input parameter that we would like to screen and the experimental output that we're interested in, and we want to know the relationship between them. Now, when you look at this curve, probably the flat regions are very easy to figure out. Um, but where it gets interesting is this nonlinear region in between. So optimally, we would like to have many experiments in this nonlinear region and fewer experiments in the flat region. So in the end, we would have tested many more parameters here versus the regions outside. And this is something that is already done in material sciences. Um, I really recommend you to read the work of Maxima and Serge, the first and last author of this paper. They do a lot of interesting work um, in, this case, in, in this area, but it's not in biology, it's material sciences, but I think a lot of it can be applied. So here's another animation that shows this, um, how an experiment would look like. And you will see the, um, so first here you see the experimental input parameters and here the output, and you see a model that we fit in real time and we refit every time we have new data. And what you also see is the model uncertainty. So here we have a high uncertainty and you see the high uncertainty plotted here. And where we have the highest uncertainty, the microscope will do the next experiment. So the next experiment, the most informative experiment will be the one that re reduces the uncertainty in our model the most you can see that this naturally leads to exploration of the parameter space. Um, if we look at the animation, you can see that it first spread out the experiments a little bit, and then it finds this um, non-linear reach, and it does a lot of experiments there until it has figured out that there's a gap, and then it starts filling in the rest of the curve. And if you're interested in trying this out, they also provide a Python library called GPEX, and it's not even that hard to set up in this kind of feedback microscopy um, setups. Now, we don't just um, have to screen for um, the largest uncertainty in the model, but we can also weight the acquisition function uh, with different interests of us. For example, we can say, okay, we want to find the maximal response to a certain output parameter. For example, which dose of light uh, gives the biggest um, activation of the cell. So again, we probably don't want to look in the low regions that we figure out um, after a couple of experiments, but we want to try and find the maximum in this high region here. So we will have more experiments in the high region versus the low regions. Um, coming back to our optogenetic experiment, here in this case, it worked really nicely. I could steer the cell upwards. It reacted, it polarized really well, but it's not always the case. For example, in this cell here, I'm able to form a protrusion, but the cell doesn't repolarize. So it still, still wants to go down and really badly. And I, I almost ripped the cell apart. It, it really doesn't repolarize. So we can guess that this, um, this kind of stimulation form is probably not the best one, but there are of course 
many different ways that we could stimulate the cell. We can increase the stimulation area. We can do gradients. We can just illuminate the edge, etc. And there are, combined with the stimulation intensity and stimulation frequency, there are millions of different patterns that we can screen. So this could be something that is um, solvable by these kind of softwares where we just give it as input parameters a function to create these different kinds of shapes and frequencies. And as output parameter, we check how well we're able to polarize the cell. Uh, we just give this task to the microscope. We go home over the weekend, come back on Monday, and it will tell us which one is the, the best way to polarize the cell. And based on that knowledge, we will hopefully get some new biological insights in how to cells process optogenetic spatial input. And yeah, this is what you're working on right now. Um, yeah, that was it. I want to thank everyone from the lab. You can see a lot of bold names. There's so many people who have contributed in the lab. It's really a family effort. Um, but also the open source software communities without whom this world would absolutely not be possible, especially Micromanager and Napari that we use every day for Micromanager, not only the software, but also the community support that the people still are doing, which is increase, uh, incredibly valuable. And yeah, I just want to thank again the whole lab and that we were able to explore these crazy ideas, even if it's not always clear what's going to come out of it, but it's incredibly fun and exciting. And I'm really excited for your comments and questions. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name absolutely correctly. I hope it's uh, not too bad. Perfect. But Thank you so much for this presentation. It's really incredible. I knew it would be very exciting, but um, seeing all the details that you're trying at the moment and the possibilities of, yeah, sort of self-optimization, doing targeted experiments, only, you know, acquiring data where it's most needed and so on, that's incredibly cool. I mean, this this would make such a big difference in science. Um, so thank you very much for sharing all of this potential with us.